But the reason is because the people who organize the matches to try to make them fair would put the good players in the bad spots and the bad players in the good spots to try to make it a fair game. But still, you can see that the scoring system makes a difference. So how do you bet in High Line? Again, how many people here go to the horse races? Some people, okay. Um, there are, in, in High Line, there were several different plays where you could bet, some of which correspond to ways you can bet in horse racing here. The most important one for our system, though, is going to be a, a way of betting called a trifecta. A trifecta means that you have to pick who is going to come in first and who is going to come in second and who is going to come in third. So if there's eight players, there's eight possibilities for who will come in first. Once that guy's come in first, there are now seven possibilities for who will come in second. And then six possibilities for who will come in third. There's 336 possible trifectas to bet on. So getting what the right one is seems like a hard thing. And so trifecta bets pay off a lot of money if you win, but they're pretty hard to win because there's a lot of different betting outcomes. Now, our system is going to end up betting mostly trifectas. And the reason is kind of interesting. It turns out that people are very good, High Life fans or no doubt horse racing fans, are pretty good at knowing how good the best horses are and who might win on a particular night. People are less good at these very, very complicated combinations of things. And so that's where it turns out that the, bet the betting opportunities for us would arise in. And there are some very interesting properties of these triples, these trifectas. If all players are equally skillful, certain of these trifectas will come in 1,000 times more often than others, just on the basis of the scoring system. 1-3-2 is something that will come in a lot because these players are all at the start of the, the, uh, the, the, the queue. They all have advantages. 6-8-7 is a bad one. All of those are at the bottom of the list. For them all to do well, somehow, all the top players have to somehow always lose and all the bottom players always win, which is very hard when they have to beat each other in order to win. So, in fact, when we looked at almost 30,000 games, none of the four combinations that we thought were the rarest ever happened because it's so hard for the players to all have that magic thing happen where all three of the bad players in the bad positions do well. So there are strong biases because of the scoring system. And that's how we thought we might be able to take advantage of it. But as we were saying, this, that's, it turns out simple mathematical models are not enough to make money. This much is clear. Um, because in fact, most people sort of understand this. If you're a High Life fan, you sort of understand everything I said so far. But what's also true is that the players have different skills. There are good players and bad players. So to try to figure out who was a good player, we wrote computer programs to download data from the web. The details I don't want to probably go into. But basically, we wrote programs that every night would go over the web and download data about the highlight matches. So we could keep track of which players won and which players lost. And based on that, we could start to answer the question, are there good players or bad players? Or are they all equally skillful? And um, when I was comparing it to get a sense of it, um, I could examine the degree to which a player that was good this year and wins a lot of matches this year, how likely is he to also win a lot of matches next year? If, in fact, the likelihood of me winning the match, if, if I'm good this year and I'm bad next year, it probably means there's not much of an effect on um, skill. On the other hand, if the same players are good year after year, that probably means that skill makes a difference. And when we analyze the correlations between different years' performances, we found, indeed, good players stay good. Bad players stay bad. So, in fact, skill does make a difference. 
So what do we need to factor into our model? We need to try to figure out what is the probability if I am playing David, what is the likelihood that I am going to win the point? That is really the question. In my simulation, I have a simulated me and a simulated David playing each other. We need to know what's the likelihood that I am going to win. And to do this, we had to analyze the data in certain ways. One thing we figured out was we knew how often every player had won or come in second or come in third. We knew where they had started. So we knew whether they started in a good spot or a bad spot. And based on that, we could figure out what fraction of the points that player probably wins against the entire field. But what we really needed to know is what is the probability that I would beat David? And so if David wins 54% of his points and I win 49% of my points, what is the likelihood that I am going to beat him in a game? And I claim it depends somewhat upon the game. Suppose we were having a tall contest where the prize goes to the person who's tallest. I might be taller than 49% of the people in the world. He might be taller than 54% of the people in the world. But if I play him in a tall contest, how often is he going to beat me? Every single time, right? Now, what if on the other hand we played in a game of coin flipping? He may have won 54% of the time. I may have won 49% of the time. But in that game, we really have a 50-50 chance against each other. Does everybody see that? So we need to somehow define a function that is going to reflect what the properties of the game are and somehow map our score differences to what is the probability that I will beat you. And I think I'm not going to give you the details. But basically, this was the probability function that we used. It was a way of taking um, the probability that he won against the field and the probability that I won against the field and some parameter A, OK, alpha here. And that would enable us me to then figure out what was the probability I would beat him in a particular game. And so now, from analyzing the past statistics, and using this function, now I have the probability that I can win. Who's going to win every point? I can now use that in every single one of those millions of games I simulate and figure out the exact probability that every player is going to win that match. Am I now ready to make money? So now, from this point, I know what is the probability that everybody's going to win. But unfortunately, that's not yet enough to make money. Because I need to know not who's going to win, but I need to know how much is it going to pay if that player wins. When you go to the horse racing, which you guys are familiar with here, right? You buy a ticket. You bet on, uh, you know, Blue Magic to win. The price that it pays is not really known at the time you buy the ticket. It's because of something they use called the paramutual system here. The price that you get paid when you win a horse racing bet is they take all the money that was bet, they put it in a pool. They take out a certain amount of money for the Hong Kong Jockey Club, probably about 20%, and that they keep, okay, to run the races and later to build universities. The remaining 80% of the money is then divided among all the people that bet on the winning horse. So it's not enough to sort of know whether or not my horse is going to win. The question of whether or not it's a good bet depends upon how many other people are also going to bet on that horse. So casinos do not use a paramutual system. When you go to a roulette wheel, you know that when you bet on red, if you win, you will get twice your money. 